Hi, everyone. Welcome to the channel. My name is Nick Cosgrove, and I'm back with this week's No Filter Q&A. This is the episode where I answer all questions related to diet, training, and supplementation that I received over the last seven days from our in-house clients, online clients, as well as a few of our online followers. Remember, if you have any questions related to your nutritional plan, workout program, supplements you're taking, not taking, considering taking, please feel free to email me those questions at nick at foreverfitperformance.com, or you can DM me your questions on my Instagram at fitcosgrove underscore. All right, so let's get started with this week's No Filter Q&A with question number one. Hi, Nick. When do you know it's time to change a fitness program? Uh, you know it's time to change a fitness program when the fitness program is no longer working for you, okay? Now, I know that's easier said than done because sometimes we get caught up in a routine and we just get so used to doing that routine and it becomes more difficult to, you know, venture off that routine and try something new, right? But, you know, the definition of insanity is trying to do the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So if you're following a workout program and it's no longer producing results, then you have to change things. But here's the thing. You have to know what to change and when to change it, okay? So, for example, if you're doing a leg workout, and you're noticing that you know your, your legs aren't getting any more muscular, you're not getting any more definition. You're you're just feeling like you're not you're 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 stagnant, right? Your results are stagnant. You're not seeing any definition in your quadriceps anymore. It's time to make a change. So instead of changing everything of the workout, you know, take out one or two exercises and supplement them in with something else. So for example, if you're doing barbell back squats, maybe take those out for a few weeks and throw in some hack squats, right? Um, if you're doing leg press, maybe take those out for a few weeks and do some leg extensions or walking lunges, right? If you're doing straight leg hamstring deadlifts, switch it up for lying hamstring curls, right? So you don't need to change up everything, but it's good to make changes when and where necessary. Now, again, this is where it comes down to working with a reputable, knowledgeable, and experienced coach because a coach is your second set of eyes. So for example, if my clients who work with me online, they send me their progress photos. And if I notice they're lacking definition, let's say in their lats, or I notice that they're um, let's say their arms are not as defined as I'd like them to be, or they're not growing as fast as I'd like them to grow. What I might do is I might change up one or two exercises in the workout and see how that goes for the next few weeks. Okay. So, and sometimes you don't even have to change up all the exercises. Sometimes it just comes down to changing up your format, your sequences, right? But it really just comes down to, if you're not seeing results, it's time to make a change. And as I said, you don't need to change up everything. And that's another thing too. A lot of people, they just want to constantly keep changing their routine because they're always looking for the next best thing. But I always tell people you should give a workout program at least six to eight weeks before you make any significant changes because it does take the body time to respond, right? Don't forget too, if you're starting on a new workout program, you're learning a lot of new exercises. You're learning new technique, how to perfect form. You're trying to figure out what weights are best for you to take. So you have to give it time. Uh, you can't just keep jumping from one new workout program to the next. That's the same thing with people who jump from one diet plan to the next, right? You have to stay committed to something for at least six to eight weeks and then make minor changes around the way, along the way, sorry. Like with myself personally, what I typically do with my own workout routine is I'll keep the same exercises in for months on end. But after a while, if I'm finding like, you know what, I'm just, I don't really see any changes in my physique. Or I'm not really challenged with this workout anymore. I might just do the workout backwards. <laughs> and, you know, if I do, for example, leg day, I might, I usually start my leg day with barbell back squats. I might end my leg day with barbell back squats. And when I do that, my legs are sore for a week because I've just shocked my body, right? So that's a good way to switch up the routine too, as opposed to just changing everything, switch up your sequences, okay? But don't try to reinvent the wheel. Don't keep skipping from one new plan to the next new plan and looking for the next best thing, okay? That's not a good idea. When you stop seeing results, make changes where necessary. If you're not sure where to make the changes, you might want to work with a coach that can help you make those changes because a good coach is going to know where to make the changes and when to make those changes. All right, uh, next question. Uh, hi, Nick. How can I become more flexible? I'm currently stretching upper body twice a week and lower body twice a week before each workout. Um, you, you know, here's the thing when it comes to mobility and flexibility, I'm a firm believer that if you are an avid weight trainer, which it sounds like you are, you can create mobility and flexibility just through the movements you're doing in the gym. So if you're doing barbell back squats, you are actually stretching out your hip flexors and hip abductors, right? If you're doing straight leg deadlifts, you are stretching out your hamstrings and your gluteus maximus, right? If you're doing overhead shoulder presses, well, you're actually stretching out anterior medial posterior deltoid chain, right? So you can get a lot of mobility and flexibility just from weight training alone. 
Um, I also recommend if you are going to stretch, my recommendation is to try to stretch at the end of a workout, not at the beginning. Now, again, if you're going to do with some dynamic stretching, which is stretching with movement prior to a workout, I see no problem with that. But you always want to stretch a muscle once it's warmed up, right? So the good idea is to take your muscle bellies through the actual exercise, through the routine, through your workout, and then stretch after your workout. So those type of stretches would be static stretching, right? If you really want to perfect your stretching, you might want to do a partner stretching, right? But perpetual neuromuscular function stretching, also known as PNF stretching. And that stretching, you need to have a partner because the partner can take you into a range of motions that you can't do on your own, like a lying hamstring stretch. Well, you could do a lying hamstring stretch by putting a towel on your foot and bringing your leg up straight to the air. But if you have a partner, that partner can add a little bit more pressure and get a greater range of motion. So partner stretching is really beneficial if you have a training partner that you work with. Um, but my recommendation is if you're going to stretch, you can stretch four times a week like you're doing. But I would actually stretch after the workout, not before the workout, because when you're stretching a muscle that's already warmed up, you're also going to help increase that mobility and flexibility, right? As opposed to stretching a cold muscle. If you are going to stretch that cold muscle as a reminder, stick to dynamic stretching and then stick to static stretching after the workout. But I would just rely on the weight training in addition to doing your stretches at the end of each workout. Uh, if you're doing two upper body days and two lower body days, preferably stretch your lower body on the lower body workouts and stretch your upper body on the upper body workouts. And that should help. But look into perpetual neuromuscular function stretching. Uh, we do that with clients all the time at our gym. It's really beneficial. Um, if I have a client who's done a leg workout with me, for example, and they're like, I can't do any more and they're still 10 minutes on the clock, I'll take them through some PNF stretches. And I'll tell you what, those stretches aren't any easier than the workout. They're not relaxing. It's actually very intense, right? So you can do glute stretches, hamstring stretches, hip stretches, shoulder stretches, chest stretches, all of partner, okay? So uh, that's something to look into. If you'd like more information on that, you can always DM me on my Instagram, fitcosgo underscore, or send me an email, nick at foreverfitperformance.com, and we can book you in for a PNF stretching session with one of our trainers. All right, uh, next question. Nick, what do you think about cardio and how much of it do you recommend if trying to lose weight? I think cardio is excellent for your heart and that's it. I strongly advise people not to rely on cardio to help you burn fat. The problem with relying on cardio to burn fat is that your body is going to constantly rely on cardio to burn fat. Okay. So I'm not against people doing cardio because as I said, I think cardio is excellent for your heart, but I would not rely, rely on it as a fat burning tool. I rely to on the weight training component and dietary nutrition for fat loss. Okay. Um, now, if you're asking how much cardio you should be doing for your heart, my recommendation, 20 to 30 minutes, three to four times a week should be sufficient. Okay. And as I've said uh, multiple times on this channel, you do not need to be on a treadmill running for 35, 40 minutes or, you know, running on a seawall uh, here in Vancouver, British Columbia for an hour, an hour and a half. I mean, that's great if you enjoy doing that, but you don't need to do that. Cardio is just getting your heart rate up, okay? Getting into what we call your fat burning zone, which believe it or not, doesn't mean you have to get your heart rate into these crazy elevated, you know, 180, 190 beats per minute, 120 beats per minute, even 110 beats per minute. That should be enough. That's fine. Okay. You just want to get that steady state. So as I mentioned before, my, my form of cardio these days is walking to and from my gym. It's about a 15, 20 minute walk. I do that twice, sometimes four times a day. Um, and that's enough cardio for me because- I find with my weight training workouts, I rest very little in between sets, as do all my clients. So I find that when you're training with very little rest and high intensity, you're also getting a cardiovascular workout in addition to the resistance training workout. So don't rely on cardio to burn fat. Okay, Rely on building muscle through weight training and focusing on proper dietary nutrition. That's the best way to burn fat. Because don't forget, once you have that muscle and you've built a foundation of muscle, the more muscle you have, and I say this time and time, I feel like I say this every week, the more muscle you have, the more calories your body's going to burn in the rest of the state. This is something I'm not just making up. I'm not just pulling out of my butt. This is true. This is science. We know this, okay? You exert more energy when you have more muscle mass. So it only makes sense to build more muscle so you're burning more calories throughout the day. So even if you're not in the gym, you're going to be burning more calories because you have more muscle mass, okay? So focus on your weight training, Focus on cardiovascular activity, absolutely. Try to keep it, like I said, 20, 30 minutes, three to four times a week for your heart, but also focus on the dietary nutrition component, okay? Because that's important. All right. 
Okay. Uh, Nick, how can I get rid of the fat under my arms? I'm currently training my arms twice each week and doing six sets for my triceps and six sets for my biceps and keeping the reps between 20 to 25 for each. I'm frustrated as my arms do not look as if they are progressing at all. A uh, few red flags I see with this particular split. First thing I would do is I would get rid of one of those arm days. Instead of training arms twice a week, go back to training arms just once a week. Increase your volume for the amount of sets that you're doing. So rather than doing six sets for triceps for one workout and six sets for triceps for another workout, I would throw in at least a minimum of 12 to 18 sets, okay? And I know that might seem like overtraining for a lot of people, but remember, I'm asking you just to do this once per week in one workout, okay? I find that works really well for uh, people when they're trying, especially women, when they're trying to bring up the back head of their triceps, okay? Um, and when you train your arms, if you can, try to superset them. So for example, if you're doing like a cable rope extension, superset that with an easy bar curl, right? Superset some dumbbell curls up against the wall with a straight bar, narrow bar, press down, right? Superset some overhead skull crushers for the back head of your triceps with some standing rope hammer curls for your biceps. Um, that's a really good way to train your arms, okay? So take the workouts down from twice a week, put them into one arm workout. So you're doing, you know, 12 to 18 sets for your triceps, 12 to 18 sets for your biceps. That shouldn't take too long. That should really take you about 35, 40 minutes max. Um, on top of that, if you're doing 20 to 25 reps, I'll be honest with you, it sounds to me like you're lifting too light, okay? So you really want to keep that rep range between 10 to 15. Do not be afraid of heavy weights. I promise you, you're not going to get that bulky look. If anything, you're going to firm that area. So you talk a lot about a lot of people, especially women, they always want to firm that area. They don't want to get what we call the bingo arms, right? The flabbiness under those arms. So how do you do that? Well, you can't do that with three pound dumbbells. You have to lift heavy weight with good form and good technique. Obviously, form and technique comes first. Range of motion, always. But you cannot really expect to see significant results if you're lifting ridiculously light weights for 20 to 25 reps. You have to build muscle with resistance. So again, I would take those workouts from two workouts to one workout. I would increase your volume, 12 to 18 sets for your triceps, 12 to 18 sets for your biceps, superset them into one workout, 35, 40 minutes max, that's all it should take. Keep those reps between 10 to 15 so the weight's heavy. Keep the form technique perfect and always, always make sure you're executing proper range of motion. Okay, and I can't stress this enough because there's so many times I see people training arms. Let's uh, use the biceps, for example. I see people come all the way up on a curl, but the problem is I don't see them coming all the way down. They go halfway down, then they go back up again. Same thing for press downs. I see people doing press downs. What I see people do, they go all the way down, but then they don't come all the way back up again. They come about halfway and then they don't, they don't really go to the full range of motion to fully extend and focus on the eccentric and the concentric movement of the press down itself, okay? So that's what I recommend. If you really want to harden the triceps, you have to focus on all three heads of those triceps and doing six sets in one workout twice a week is not gonna cut it. You've gotta do minimum 12 sets preferably 18 sets, all in one workout for those triceps. Keep the weight relatively heavy, reps 10 to 15, rest very little between sets, superset the shit out of those muscles, and that should really help tone up your arms. I know I use the word tone up, but that will work, I promise you. Okay. Uh, hi, Nick, I'm a new subscriber, and I'm sure you have answered this question before, but could you please tell me what I should eat before and after my workouts? Thanks, Nick. Um, it's not one particular meal that you need to eat before your workout and one particular meal that you have to eat after your workout. But ideally, if you're trying to look at pre-workout nutrition, and that is if you're someone who actually eats before the gym, because don't forget, a lot of people actually respond better to not eating before the gym. This will depend on your metabolism. I've spoken about this before too. Uh, a lot of my clients who train with me from, let's say, six in the morning to about nine in the morning, not a single one of them has anything to eat prior to the workouts. So it's just too early in the morning. Wake up, um, waking up too early after, you know, out of, coming out of bed and going right to the gym. So, you know, a lot of people cannot digest their food as quickly. So not everyone needs to eat before a workout. But if you're eating, if you're working out, sorry, I should say later on in the day, and you've been up for four or five hours, you might want to have something in your stomach and it doesn't have to be something big. So this is where it comes down to knowing your body and knowing your digestive system. So if you're someone who digests food very quickly, like myself, you can eat three minutes before a workout and you're fine. But if you're someone who needs a little bit more time in between, you got to plan out, strategically plan out that meal, maybe 45 minutes to an hour before you go to the gym. Okay, but regardless, my work, my recommendation for everyone when it comes to pre-workout meals 
or as a good complex carbohydrate source. So something like oatmeal, cream of rice, yams, sweet potatoes, brown rice, quinoa, and combined with a lean protein source. So something like a chicken breast, uh, turkey breast, lean ground turkey, um, you know, something that's a, a cod, something very lean, like a whey isolate, right? Egg whites. So that's something that has very little to no fat in it. Okay? Um, I always advise people to try to avoid fats before a workout. Reason why is fats take longer for the body to digest. So for example, if you have peanut butter before a workout, well, peanut butter is a healthy fat. It's a great food, but if you have it before a workout, it's going to take your body a little bit longer to digest that food. So the last thing you want is being in the gym, lifting heavy weights, working out super intensely, and now your stomach is trying to digest food. It's not a good feeling, okay? If you've ever felt that before in the gym, you know what I'm talking about. It just doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel natural. So that's why I recommend to save your fats for post-workout. So then we get to the post-workout meal. So what do you eat post-workout? Well, rule of thumb is you want to get some protein in, right? Now, I'm not a firm believer that that protein has to be taken in within five minutes after the workout, like some uh, <laughs> fitness experts claim. As long as you're getting that protein in within at least a two to three hour window, that's fine. Okay, so protein's number one. So you're looking to get a good protein source again, but I usually recommend something like a fatty protein source. So something like salmon, avocado, omega-3 eggs. For the exact reason, it takes longer for the body to digest that food. So it's actually going to break it down more slowly. And that's okay. You don't need to get protein delivered to your muscles within five minutes. That's this nonsense. Just let your body take in the nutrients naturally. Let them break it down naturally. Okay. And then again, you can combine that with a complex carbohydrate source, uh, like the other ones I mentioned, oatmeal, cream of rice, brown rice, quinoa, yam, sweet potatoes. Okay. So ideally, a lean protein source combined with a complex carbohydrate pre-workout and then a fatty protein source combined with a complex carbohydrate post-workout. That's my recommendation for pre-workout versus post-workout nutrition. All right. Okay, next question. Uh, Nick, what do you think about Sam Sulik? Do you think he's a good influence for the sport of bodybuilding? Uh, I had this question come in about two weeks ago, and I, and I have to apologize for not responding right away. I didn't actually know who Sam Sulik was, so I had to Google him. Um, I went on his Instagram. I went on his YouTube channel. So it seems like the kid's doing really well as far as uh, his YouTube subscribers, and then he's doing a hell of a lot better than me, and uh, his social media content. And, you know, I like Sam. I, I, think, he's a, he's, I think he's a funny guy. Uh, if anyone doesn't know this guy, I think he's like 21, 22 years old. Crazy genetics. Um, obviously on steroids, yes. But even without the steroids, this guy's just got crazy genetics for his age, for the muscle mass that he's added on. It's, it's quite impressive. Um, I'll tell you what I like about Sam, though. All his content is filmed just with like an iPhone, pretty much. Like it's not really all these special effects. It's just like raw footage of him in the gym training, him shopping for groceries. And I like for me, I like that. Um, I, I don't need to see all these videos that are edited and like, look at the video I put up now. I don't, I don't really care about that. Um, I just want the information. I want to give out the information. I want to take in the information. I could care less about the backdrop, the editing, the music and all that stuff. So I like that. He just gives it how it is just raw him in the gym training, right? Him grocery shopping, him eating. That's what I like about Sam. Okay. Um, but here's where I take an issue with Sam Sulik. I think he's sending out a somewhat of a dangerous and irresponsible message to the younger generation. So what I mean by that, if you look at his diet, his diet is not good. <laughs> For the average person following a diet like that, if you if you don't know what I'm talking about, go to Sam Sulik's YouTube channel and watch him grocery shopping. He's buying a lot of fatty meats like ribeye. He's buying um, ice cream, uh, you know, a lot of pastries, all kinds of junk food, cereals. And this is, he believes that calories are just calories and what you just got to keep eating to put on weight. Now, that's the what we call the seafood diet. You see it, you eat it. And that was very popular back in the 90s with a lot of bodybuilders. So, you know, just in the off season, just eat food for calories. You want to just get as many calories you can get in, right? That's going to help put on size. Sam even says it himself in his channels, in his YouTube videos. He's like, if the weight's not going up on the scale, you just got to eat more food. I take a different approach with that. You know, if anyone follows me, you know I'm a firm believer in not just the macronutrients, but the micronutrients, the quality of the food you are consuming. If you have a Ferrari, you're not gonna fuel, you're not gonna fuel your Ferrari with cheap gas, right? No, you're gonna put in optimum gas. So same thing with your body. Why would you put cheap crap food in your body? Right. So I think it's irresponsible in that way to 
for him to be saying you just have to get calories in because again, he's only 21. So that's sending the wrong message to a lot of his followers. And he's got millions of followers at this point. And a lot of those followers are, you know, guys 15 through 18 years old who look up to him. So it's giving, it's setting a bad precedence for what it really takes to develop, not just a good physique, but also what it takes to be healthy and fit, right? So yeah, if you're going to the gym and you're eating pop tarts and you're eating uh ice cream and you're 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 putting on weight most people especially if they're not on the anabolic steroids if they're not on fat burners they're going to put on sloppy weight so they will put on muscle but it's not going to be hard lean dense muscle you're going to look fat and sloppy i've seen it it doesn't look good so i think that sends the wrong message out okay um i, th I think what sam should be saying is you know this is what i do and it works for me but i'm not recommending that it, you do it and i i haven't heard him say that so I think that's something, you know, if you become a social media influencer, and I think he wants to compete in bodybuilding one day, I don't think he's done a, sh a show yet, but you're going to have people that look up to you and you've got to make sure you're getting the right message across. So even if you're someone who eats all that drunk food and you, you know, you're on an anabolic steroid cycle, as long as you're transparent about that, and he is very transparent about that, but as long as you're transparent and say, hey, look, this is what works for me. My blood work has come back and looks, looks fine. And by the way, I don't know what his blood work looks like, but let's just say his blood work is perfect. That is like a genetic freak. Okay. And those don't come along very often. Ronnie Coleman, perfect example, genetic freak. So just because Ronnie Coleman can put barbecue sauce all over his chicken a one week out before a bodybuilding show, that doesn't mean that 98% of the population can do the same thing because they can't. Okay? He's a genetic freak. So Sam in many ways is a genetic freak. So I think as he grows into this industry, if he decides to compete, I say go for it. The guy's got a great physique. He could definitely do some damage. I definitely think he'd get his pro card. But I do think he has to set the right message. And he's got a responsibility now because he's got all these followers. And people look up to him. And if you are someone who is a influencer whether it's on social media in the fitness industry bodybuilding what if you have people that look up to you and they take everything you say and they they put it to the, you know they practice what you preach that's going to become problematic for a lot of these kids okay so i think it's important that he just again make sure that his fans and his followers understand that this is what works for him and that no it's not going to work for everyone it's the same thing I tell people. I say, yeah, I easily consume eight to 10,000 calories a day. Do I recommend clients do that? Absolutely not. But I have a crazy fast metabolism. So, I mean, I can get away with it. But 90% of the people I work with, if I put them on a diet like that, they're going to get fat. So I don't tell them to do that. But myself personally, I can do it. So it works for me. But I make sure that people understand what works for me is not necessarily going to work for you. So we have to find a plan that works specifically for you by customizing the program for your goals, your lifestyle, and most importantly, your genetics. All right, uh, next question. Uh, hi, Nick. Does drinking water before a meal really help with weight loss? That's a good question. I don't know if there's any science backing that claim. But I can see how it could help with weight loss because if you drink, let's say, you know, two cups of water before a meal, your stomach is obviously going to be full, right? So you, your ability to take in as much food might be limited. So therefore, you're going to eat less food and therefore take in less calories. So in hindsight, yeah, I, I can see how that could help, right? Because it would actually help slow down first your metabolism, um, not slow down your sorry, that, that's wrong. <laughs> It's not going to help slow down your metabolism, but it's going to help slow down the digestive tract. So therefore, you're actually not going to be consuming as much food because you're not able to digest it quickly enough, right? So your your stomach is already going to be full, okay? Um, I do not think, and this is why I said the metabolism, because I've heard this before, I, I don't think it does anything to your metabolism. I don't think it does anything to the whole thermogenesis or anything like that. I haven't seen any concrete scientific studies that back those claims when it comes to having water um, before you eat. But I can see how it would slow down the digestive tract as a whole, and therefore it would help keep you feeling fuller for a longer period of time. So you feel very full very quickly from eating, right? Because um, you can't digest that food as quickly. So I, I don't see any harm doing it. Um, and I, I could see how it could work. Yes. So if you are looking to lose weight, uh, I'd say try it and see. It's not something that I personally have ever tried myself, but I know people that do believe in doing that. And I, I do think it can work. So can't hurt. Okay? It's water. Your body needs water. So the more water you drink, the better anyway. So try it out and see. And you tell me if it works for you. I've never tried it, but uh, I just always practice portion control. And that's just something that I've gotten into routine over the years. 
And I find that works best for everyone. When I have a meal that's already portioned out for me, once the meal is done, that's it. I don't get to go back for seconds. I don't get to have dessert. The meal is done. So portion controls always work best for me. But if you find that uh, having, you know, two or three cups of water before you eat helps fully fill you up faster, I say do it. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Another cardio question. Uh, Nick, is it better to do cardio before or after a weight training session? I would like to lose 25 pounds before June. Uh, so as I mentioned before, you really shouldn't be relying on cardio to burn fat. However, if you are going to do cardio, my recommendation, if your goal is to lose weight, is to do your cardio after your workout, okay? Because if you do your cardio after your workout, you're already gonna be in what we call a fasted state. So your body is gonna be using fat as its primary fuel source and not the carbohydrates from your meal earlier. So if your goal is to lose, in your case, uh, 25 pounds, you're going to get more out of your workouts in the gym if you do your cardio after your workouts. And don't forget too, if you are eating before a workout, you want to use those calories for the gym, for the weights, right? Because you want to replenish those glycogen storages. So if you're someone who has, let's say, oatmeal and protein uh, powder right before you go to the gym, you want to utilize those calories to the best of your ability. So you don't want to utilize them by running on a treadmill. You want to utilize them in the gym where you're going to need them the most, lifting heavy weight with intensity. So that's why I always recommend people do cardio after a workout. I don't, I don't mind if people want to do a little bit of light cardio before a workout just to warm up the joints and the tendons. That's fine. Um, but if you're looking for fat loss, my recommendation, do your cardio after your workout as opposed to before your workout. Okay, That's going to help produce optimal results. Okay. Uh, Nick, what... What is the most amount of days you would recommend a person work out before they take a day off in the gym? My coworker tells me that I need to take rest days in order to recover properly, but I feel like I need, I don't need one right now. Will this negatively impact my results by taking rest, by not taking rest days? So today, as this comes out, as I'm recording this, um, this particular video, it's Sunday, January the 28th. Um, I am on day 28 of nonstop workouts. So I haven't taken a rest day for all of January. And the reason I'm doing this is more to prove to people that you actually can train every day and still feel great. I don't feel overtrained. I don't feel sore. I don't feel grumpy. I don't feel irritable. Uh, I have great libido. I have lots of energy. Okay. And I've worked out 28 days in a row and I'm still alive. I haven't died. So my point here is that if you put in, and I've mentioned this for the last two weeks, if you put together a well-balanced, structured training program, there's no reason why you can't train every day if you feel you can, okay? And, you know, I train intensely, as I'm sure you do as well. So it's not like I go easy on myself. I train very hard in the gym. And I feel like by working out intelligently, like using, pro, uh, using intelligence while training and approaching each workout methodically and saying, okay, how am I going to do this exercise? Should I do this exercise today? Or maybe should I tweak this exercise because, oh, maybe my back is just a little tight. So maybe I should put this exercise more towards the end of my workout when I'm more warmed up. So it's listening to your body, right? Um, but I follow a five-day training split and I've just been doing week after week after week in the gym, no rest days. Don't feel I need them, okay? So I can't tell you, you need to take a rest day off every three days or every four days or once a week because I'd be, that'd be very hypocritical of me to tell you that because I don't believe in that. So my answer to you is take a rest day off when you feel you need a rest day off, okay? Just make sure you are following a well-balanced structured program. So don't go in the gym and squat three times a week, right? Squat once a week, right? Don't go into uh, the gym and bench press every day, right? Bench press once a week. If you're following a five-day rotation split like I am, you might bench on Sunday, but then you're not going to bench again till maybe Saturday or Sunday. So yeah, in that case, you might be benching twice a week, but you have a huge break in between those days. So there's still enough time to recover that, that muscle group. And if you focus on training one muscle group per day, like I recommend, like chest on one day, back on one day, arms on one day, shoulders on one day, legs on one day, I see no reason why you can't keep just doing that rotation over and over again. And then listen to your body. If your body says, hey, I need a break today. I'm sore. It just doesn't feel right. And you feel like you're going to injure yourself. Listen to your body. Take it off. That's what I've always done. I've just listened to my body. Well, when I first started working out, I always used to listen to the so-called experts that I'd read in magazines. I mean, magazines aren't around anymore. But when I first started, it was all about what the experts said. Take 
two days off a week in the gym, uh, you know, work out Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday, and take Sunday, Tuesday, whatever off. I'm like, okay, I'll do that. But I didn't find that was that beneficial to me whatsoever. So I train because I like to train. I know a lot of people enjoy training, not just for the physical benefits, but for the mental benefits. So I say, if you feel good, you don't feel burnt out, keep training. Uh, take your day off when you feel you need your day off. Your coworker is not inside your body. Your coworker does not have the same lifestyle as you, right? Same genetics as you, same dietary nutritional plan as you. I, I'm a firm believer if you're following a solid dietary nutritional plan, you should feel great all the time. So I, I, I get loads of vitamins and minerals into my own diet plan. So I always feel good. I always have lots of energy. Uh, I don't crash in the afternoon. I don't rely on stimulants to keep me awake. That's optimal nutrition. And if you're following a good diet plan, you probably could train every day and maybe take a rest only when you have to. And when you have to, maybe schedule conflict, right? Family function, uh, work-related issue. That's usually when I take a rest day off because I like basically do not have five minutes in my day. I'm in back-to-back -back meetings or something's going on where I'm just like, you know what, it's not going to work today. But not because I'm like, oh, I'm burnt out. No, I, I, that's, that's me. So you do you. You take a day off when you feel you need a day off. Just make sure you structure and balance out your workout program accordingly. All right. Okay. Last question. Uh, Nick, how do you make your meals less boring? I'm getting sick of eating the same foods day in and day out. And as a result, I end up cheating extra hard on my cheat days. Um, what I find works for this is a lot of sugar-free or low sugar condiments. Okay. Like sugar-free ketchup, uh, things like mustard, uh, I use a Bragg soy sauce, which is a very low sodium soy sauce. Um, stuff like that really helps add more flavor to my foods. I'm also a firm believer in using lots of spices. And I personally don't have a heart condition, so I'm not really afraid of sodium. Obviously, if you do have a heart condition, you've got to watch your sodium intake. But I'll even throw stuff on like um, Montreal chicken spice, Montreal steak spice, lots of cinnamon um, onto my food to add more flavor. Okay, so spices and very low or to no sugar condiments really help add more flavor to your meals. Um, also, how you cook your meals. So sometimes, and again, I know it doesn't sound super exciting, but sometimes what I'll do with my yams, for example, sometimes I'll steam them. Like I'll, I'll put them in the pot in some water and I'll just steam them and boil them. Um, other times I'll put them in my oven and I'll create like yam fries. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll eat the, the, the texture will taste a little bit different, right? Um, instead of doing brown rice, I might do quinoa or sometimes I'll even mix the two into one because they're from a macronutrient scale, they're pretty much the same. Like we're, we're talking like five, 10 different grams of carbohydrates, really. So I'll just mix them into one. There's times where I'll even mix my sweet potatoes in with my rice and just do half and half. So that adds a little bit more, uh, you know, flavor and just a little it keeps the meals more interesting another thing i do is i tend to rotate my meals just like i rotate my workouts so in the winter i'll do a lot of chicken and turkey and in the summer i'll do a lot of salmon and cod so usually from you know let's say may till october i'll just be doing fish as my protein source and then moving on into the winter and spring i'll be doing chicken and turkey so i'm not eating the same thing day in and day out 365 days a year because that does get boring so i would recommend rotating up your protein uh, sources every once in a while and like i said use lots of spices uh, if you don't have a heart condition you don't have to worry too much about sodium but again you should try to limit your sodium and take overall you don't want to be taking too much sodium but as a reminder our bodies do need sodium so don't limit it too much um Spices, low sugar, to no sugar condiments, rotate your protein sources, Cal, rotate your carbohydrate sources. Um, there's times where I'll do oatmeal for six months straight, and then I'll switch it over to something like Ezekiel bread for six months straight. So that'll be my, my carbohydrate. So from a macronutrient scale, they're, they're pretty much the same. And of course, as I mentioned before, you should be looking at the micronutrients anyway. So as long as the quality of the food that you're consuming and you're supplementing out one food for the other food, it should be fine, right? As long as your micronutrients are in check with your macronutrients, that should be fine. So that's what I recommend. But eating healthy doesn't need to be boring. You just have to be creative. And that's so important. Um, one of the things I do with my ground turkey is I usually chop up a bunch of green peppers, onions, uh, sometimes some tomato, and I'll throw it in there just as a mix. And last night, we uh, what do we do? We, we put ground turkey and stuffed peppers. So I'm eating the same thing, but it was just different because now the ground turkey is actually in a stuffed, like we, we, we stuffed it in a pepper. So it doesn't sound super exciting, but it was different. So I wasn't, oh, this is going to be ground turkey again, which, you know, in a bowl of brown rice. No, it was ground turkey in a pepper and we had some yams. Tasted great, right? So, I mean, you can, you can mix it up a little bit. 
but it doesn't have to be boring, okay? So that's my recommendation. Spices, low to no cal uh, sugar condiments. Rotate your protein sources, your carbohydrate sources, so you're constantly getting in new foods. And that should help keep things more interesting. Um, anyway, that's it for this week's No Filter Q&A. Uh, this episode will be going up on Tuesday, January the 30th. As a reminder, if you do have any questions related to your diet, training, or supplementation, to please feel free to email me at nick at foreverfitperformance.com, or you can send me your questions on my Instagram at fitcosgo underscore. I want to thank everyone for supporting the channel. Thank you for supporting my business. Thank you for supporting my online coaching app. I appreciate all the support. And again, thank you all so much. So have a great evening, and I will see you all next week. Bye for now.